Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, and uh, so now uh, it's going to be a pleasure to introduce uh, Matthias Bergblok, the, who is going to talk about all adapted topologies are equal. Hi. Um, thanks a lot for this opportunity. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks a lot, Live. Um, I will speak about uh, um, results uh, um, which are um, joined uh, with uh, these people. Um, this will be more of a survey talk, so there will be um, many results which are not by us, but, but uh, which are by other people. Um, so since this is a survey talk, this could give the impression that this is uh, somehow an, an area which um, we invented and I want to very much emphasize that this is not true. So this is a very old area which or has uh, many different routes. Um, we specifically got interested uh, because of applications in mathematical finance. Um, you shouldn't be scared. There will be almost no math finance in this talk. I just want to very briefly sketch um, what the original problem was. I mean, so in, in math finance, um, what you usually do is um, you um, pick a model and you hope that this is close to reality, to some real evolution of some, um, some asset price process. And then if this is close to reality, you hope that um, your um, predictions about uh, prices or trading strategies are close to useful in reality. And of course, uh, I mean, uh, we would like to have statements like this in our field. And um, a, a big problem with this turns out to be that um, something like this is not at all true. And the reason is that, uh, or it's not at all true, in particular, if you uh, look at uh, usual topologies, so for simplicity, um, assume that we are in a discrete time framework then in probability we would like to um, look at uh, some, some version of weak convergence and then you find out that uh, any type of this statement is not true. And the very simple reason is that uh, um, being close in, in something uh, like, uh, like uh, Wasserstein distance or weak topology doesn't tell you much about the probability properties like uh, being a martingale or being almost a martingale. And this completely screws up things if you want to, to prove um, uh, results like this in finance. So our main motivation was um, try to understand what kind of closeness one should use at this stage. And I should say that uh, this is not uh, my work. This goes back rather to work of, of Beatrice Achayo and Julio Bakov, and is uh, in some sense also present in, in earlier work of Jan Dolinsky. Um, okay, so to be more concrete, during this talk, we will um, mainly focus on finite discrete time. Um, I'm talking here about Rn, so the idea is that we have a one-dimensional state space. Instead of R, it could be an arbitrary polar space, but it won't matter during this talk. And then um, we ask questions like, when are stochastic processes similar? And what we mean by this is, when are they similar in the sense that their laws are similar to each other? And um, I want to illustrate um, uh, uh, what we are after with uh, with a simple example. In any case, I think this example is the most important message of my talk. So if you have questions concerning this example, please go ahead and ask. So the idea is I want to consider a, a simple process which has just two time steps. And the evolution of this is described through a probability measure P. And this probability measure is just saying we start uh, at, at one, at time one. And then with uh, probability one half, you go up, or with probability one half, you go down. So super simple um, one step martingale. And I want to compare this with um, another process, which, depending on perspective, is uh, similar or not similar. So I want to compare this with a process which um, looks like this. So let's zoom in a little bit to understand what's happening here. 
I want that um, at time one, the starting points of this process are an epsilon apart. So this is my process yt and its law is maybe described by a probability measure p epsilon. And now um, uh, we want to consider two exercises. And the first exercise is, um, this first exercise we want to kind of show that these two processes are close. And to do that, we calculate the Wasserstein distance of these processes. So we calculate uh, one Wasserstein distance, which for the purpose of this talk is simply given as an infimum over mappings from R2 to R2, which have the property that they push the one law to the other law. And whenever we um, transport a particle with this mapping, we pay a cost, which is just a distance. And then in the end, we sum over, um, over all particles. Okay, so the first exercise is understand what this Wasserstein distance is. And um, maybe you can use the chat if you have an answer to this. And yeah, I mean, I don't know. I have uh, co-authors present, so at least uh, they should know the answer, yeah? Um, a second exercise, um, this is looking at something different. This is uh, uh, trying, so I mean, probabilistically, we think that those processes are not so close to each other. I mean, one process is a martingale, the other one is deterministic. And um, with the second exercise, we would like to understand um, how this, uh, leads to some non-similarity in probabilistic terms. So my second exercise would be look at optimal stopping problems. So you take an infimum over expectation of x tau, where tau is a stopping time. And well, uh, first you want to calculate it for the left-hand side process, and then you want to do the same problem for the right-hand side process. Um, okay, so this, uh, I mean, either uh, this um, this uh, version with the chat doesn't work for me or the exercise is too hard, but so far I don't see answers to the first question. Um, I mean, I, I'll give you a hint. So um, what your good mapping is doing, it is taking this kind of path and it is attaching it so this kind of path, so this is uh, one half of my mapping T and the other half of my mapping T is doing the same with the other path. And in each case, uh, the distance of uh, uh, the origin and the target is going to be less than epsilon. So um, maybe we can agree that this is at least a smaller equal than epsilon, yeah? So this is uh, what this, uh, this first part is, is trying to, to communicate is that in Wasserstein distance or in any other uh, version of, of some weak topology, of course, those two processes are very close to each other. Um, the second exercise, um, well, the first process is a martingale. If you stop a martingale, then uh, you just obtain the value at the beginning. So here we have the value one. And on the other hand, in the second process, um, we could be a little bit, bit smarter. So we could stop the second process. Um, if we are on the upper path, we know that in the future, we're just going to go up. And so it's a good idea to stop the path here. Whereas the other path, uh, here we know that we are going to be smaller in the beginning. So here we go on. And in the end, what we get here is, is roughly one half. Okay, so the story I'm trying to tell you here is um, if you are close with respect to weak topology, this will not at all tell you something about being similar in probabilistic terms. And in particular, if you look at probabilistic decision problems, then you obtain um, very different results potentially. Um, so uh, the goal of this talk is uh, uh, to discuss what is a good notion of topology or what is a good notion of distance that allows you uh, to, to separate such different probabilistic behavior. 
And uh, I mean, you might expect that um, I, we are not the first ones to ask such questions. So um, what I will do uh, for the next portion of my talk is I will discuss um, approaches which um, people in history have come up with uh, to try to deal with similar questions. And um, the first such uh, um, topology is a um, so-called extended weak topology of David Ellers. I mean, David Ellers is, uh, is starting to associate to the law of the process, the so-called prediction process. And down here, we have the definition of the prediction process. Uh, but actually, um, I think this definition is relatively complicated. So unless you are um, very sharp and fast and uh, I'm talking too slow for you, then I suggest you just uh, um, don't read this definition if you, are, um, if you don't already know it because, um, or at least me, it took me quite a while to digest what this is really supposed to mean. And we'll also not need it much in the rest of the talk. Um, the reason uh, or, or what we need about this prediction process is that this prediction process is a way to embed this space of, of laws of processes into a bigger set where um, the corresponding objects uh, um, have much finer structure. So where you have, uh, because you're living in, 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 in a much finer environment, um, you can say some, oh, I'm super happy that I have some question here. Is there a typo in phi? Um, can you be more specific with this question? The image of phi? Uh, ah, okay, now I, I get it. Um, so the question is, if this is the typo, maybe? I think, so it's not a typo, it's, um, of course, so here we have uh, uh, the whole of Rn, and here we also have the whole of Rn. But uh, um, of course, you are right, it would not be necessary to include this. You would have, in fact, the same information if you forget about this first coordinate, and also if you forget about the first coordinate here. Um, it's not super important for this talk. Um, what is important here is um, what we have here. These are all. Um, much larger um, spaces, we can endow each of these spaces um, with a weak topology. Then we have a product of, of many different spaces, um, or which are all Polish spaces. So in the end, we get a Polish space, and then we look at probability spaces up there. And then we have some very complicated object, uh, but because everything is still Polish, we still have a usual weak topology in this very big space. And then the idea is um, we can um, pull this very big topology back to the original space. And then this gives you on the original space um, an, a topology which is um, for n bigger equal than two strictly finer than the usual weak topology. Ah, okay, now this is um, really a typo, yeah. Thanks a lot, Stan and Julio. So this should be x1, x2. Um, okay, and uh, one comment here, this, uh, this um, uh, topology of Elders, this is for instance, fixing the problem which we had in the previous slide. So with respect to this extended weak topology, optimal stopping will be continuous. Um, uh, and, and another uh, such topology was introduced by Martin Helwig. He's uh, an economist. He's interested in stochastic games. And um, what he's doing is he's uh, just, uh, he's always separating the process into two components, into past and future. He defines some kind of disintegration of uh, the future with respect to the past, which is similar to what Ellos is doing. And again, this allows, this gives you embeddings into um, spaces which are more complicated, but still carry a weak topology. And then uh, you pull back your uh, weak topology there and obtain uh, a finer topology in the original space. And in the case of Helwig, he obtains what's, what he's calling 
the information topology. Um, in the next step, I want to discuss a topology which is um, more closely related to the Wasserstein topology we have seen in the beginning. Um, so here I have uh, put again just uh, the usual definition of, of Wasserstein distance as we had it on the second slide. I mean, it's not really a definition because we are only considering mappings, but uh, if, if the uh, measure P is somewhat continuous, that's, that's no issue. And uh, I want to rewrite this uh, um, push forward condition a bit. I want to make explicit that this mapping T is a mapping uh, from Rn to Rn, and hence it uh, really consists of um, n individual mappings. And I mean, if I write it like this, then uh, you already may recognize the similarity uh, to a stochastic process. And um, now if you think probabilistically, what this mapping T is doing, it's uh, um, taking the first uh, T uh, coordinates of the measure P and takes them to the first T coordinates of the measure Q. And if you want to do this in a way that respects the flow of information, then probably you should do what you usually do in, in probability you should ask that this mapping, that this uh, family of mappings as a process is adapted. And this is precisely what's happening in the definition of cause and Wasserstein distance. Um, so the idea here would, to, would be to um, uh, put this, uh, this uh, condition of adaptedness into the condition uh, of, of matching probabilities, probability measures. And if we just uh, um, do it like this, then we obtain something which is not symmetric and uh, therefore it will not yet define as symmetric. But of course you can easily make it symmetric by just uh, switching the order of, of Q and P and then taking something like the maximum or the sum of those two components. And uh, what we obtain in this way, this we will call, uh, call a symmetric, uh, symmetrized causal Wasserstein distance. Um, okay, and then, I mean, if you know optimal transport, then you're of course aware that in, usually we do not look just at, uh, um, at mappings T, but rather we look at couplings. So also here, if we want to make the official definition then um, we would uh, uh, refer to the set of, of, of couplings and which are in addition uh, causal. And um, once again, I want to say that this is, uh, this is um, confusing and I recommend that you don't read it. I mean, the idea is uh, a mapping is a adapted if uh, the first uh, T coordinates of the mapping depend only of, on the first T coordinates uh, uh, in the origin. And this is somehow rephrased here that saying that uh, if you're given X1 to XT, then Y1 to YT is independent of the tail. Yeah, so I think if you, uh, if you think hard and concentrate, concentrated, then this is the very natural, def this is the natural definition, but um, I don't know, it takes, uh, takes some digestion to find it that natural, yeah. Um, okay, I want to come to another construction and in a way this is very similar to this uh, uh, causal distance. Uh, this is a construction which, um, I mean, early work in this direction is, is going back to, to Rüschendorf. Independently of Rüschendorf, this was discovered by Pflug and Pichler and Pflug and Pichler, they come from optimization and statistics and um, uh, I mean, they are more, much more, they are more, more, more interested in the applied side. And I mean, they have uh, many interesting papers about applications of what they call the nested distance. And um, more recently in continuous time, coming from a very different direction, this was also uh, um, investigated by Bion Nadal and Palais. And uh, this distance, this is usually called nested distance because uh, if you look at usual definitions of this, uh, then it, this is defined in some iterative way. Um, I have here put an equivalent definition which uh, makes the connection to the call to causal transport uh, more apparent. 
So here the idea is um, you don't symmetrize in the end, but you symmetrize already here on the level of couplings. So already on the level of couplings, you say that um, pi as well as what you obtain from pi by, by simply switching the roles of x and y is um, also something which is causal. Um, yeah, I think even, I have a quick question. Um, when, when you talk about these uh, Markov constructions, I mean, what it comes to my mind is that uh, uh, usually, well, usually you want to build a upper bound for whatever distance you want to compute, and you do it with a coupling. And usually, uh, uh, it's very convenient to think about uh, augmenting your space with some randomness, then defining an, uh, a clever uh, Markov chain that couples the, the two things, and and that's it. I mean. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is are these uh, distances related to the to that concept? Um, I thank you for this question. Honestly, I'm uh, way too nervous to say anything useful there. Uh, no, of okay. course, um, of course, it's a very good question, and of course, my co-authors in the chat will give the appropriate answer, but I don't have the time to do it here. Okay, so I will continue. Okay. Um, Something, okay, with what I want to emphasize is that, um, I mean, um, all these researchers are coming from, from very different areas, yeah? And uh, actually at very different times, so they are not really aware of each other. And uh, as a consequence, um, they are not looking at each other's work and um, not at the connections. Okay, now, um, I mean, the spoiler was in the title. Our main result is that um, all of these different uh, concepts uh, actually lead to the same topology. Um, okay, I mean, if you know weak topology, then of course uh, there is many definitions of weak topology and it's uh, really an exercise to understand that they are related. Uh, I want to make the point that, I mean, at least for me, this was not the case here, yeah, so, um, uh, I found it uh, very hard to understand the connections between these different definitions. Yeah, and I mean, also very often if you uh, do joint work, then you think um, maybe I could have done the same alone. It just would have taken longer. Okay, so I want to say this is certainly not true here. So I'm very much relying on on the work of my my co-authors in this result. Yeah, and um, I mean somehow what seems to make this hard is I mean on the one hand there is some or hard for me at least there is some analysis component on the one side. And this has to be um, intermixed with, in many clever, clever ways with uh, some algebraic arguments, which help you to um, step up and down of these uh, different levels of, of, of um, uh, forming another set of, of probability measures, of probability measures, and so on. And this is uh, what, what makes this um, not so clear. Um, I mean, uh, another hint why this is, um, not maybe not a trivial equivalence is that um, in all of this uh, for all of these topologies you can actually attach uh, natural metrics to these topologies and uh, these metrics they are not equivalent yeah so not even if you restrict to probabilities which are concentrated on some compact domain uh, they are still uh, they are not not equivalent as metrics um, yeah, in applications, I think knowing that those are um, equivalent, this is useful because, um, well, some of these things uh, feel much stronger than others. So for instance, if you know convergence and nested distance, then this is usually a very strong uh, assumption to prove something. Uh, on the other hand, it is uh, in itself, I think it's, it's usually uh, very hard to establish. Ah, uh, you don't see the result. The result, okay, the result is in the title. This is kind of saving me. Um, the result is all adapted topologies are equal. I hope that I can uh, repair my screen. Ah, yeah, yeah, I cannot repair my screen. This is the result. Oh, sorry. Okay, so the last 10 minutes, I've been talking about the result which was not seen. 
Um, thank you for your patience. Okay, our result is all topologies are equal, and the reason it's, it's, it's useful is that, um, yeah, depending on what you do, you want to use very different definitions. If you want to prove something, you want to have the nested distance. If you want to prove that something is true, you want to start with Helvig. If you look for applications uh, in my findings, then usually you would like to look at causal transport. Um, Okay, so these are these were four topologies which uh, have been investigated in the history. Um, in some sense, this result is more universally true. So um, other topologies which maybe have not been considered so much. Um, well, one is building on, on this notion of equivalent, or on a notion of equivalence of adapted processes of Hoover and Kiesler. They come from logic. I will not explain what, what they are doing. But again, uh, it leads to a natural extension of the usual topology, and again, it's the same extension. And uh, six is uh, another way to form a topology from a causal Wasserstein distance, and again, it turns out to be the same. And in seven, um, I mean, if you are if you are working a bit with couplings, then you know the knote rosenblatt coupling, which is a very specific coupling which is discriminating between uh, coordinates in, in RM, and you can take the costs of knote rosenblatt and use it to, to define a distance. And uh, once again, it's, it turns out to be, to give you the same kind of topology. Yeah, so um, I think uh, this is a, a nice fact, and um, in the sense that uh, if many people independently come up with uh, something which then it turns out to be the same thing, they're maybe something natural here. Um, next, I want to briefly discuss some consequences of this. And in these consequences, um, I mentioned another fact about this weak adapted topologies, which is uh, often playing a very important role. Namely, I mean, if you think about usual weak topology, this is such a useful concept because we understand so very well what relatively compact sets are, thanks to Prokhorov's theorem. Something which uh, makes uh, working with these adapted versions very easy or often very convenient is that also for this finer, for this uh, actually much finer topology, um, you still have the same uh, pre compact sets. Um, the first application which I want to discuss is uh, concerning, is going back to this um, optimal stopping problem which we had in the beginning. So I already mentioned that if you look at the extended weak topology of David Elders, then uh, with respect to this topology, you have continuity of optimal stopping uh, with respect to the, to the underlying measure with which you do the stopping. And it turns out that um, as soon as you want to have this property, you automatically have to use um, at least this weak adapted topology. So this is the weakest topology, which gives you continuity of optimal stopping. And um, I mean, once again, this is something, I mean, to prove such a result, it's very important to know the equivalence between these different definitions because Getting continuity from the nested distance is very easy. On the other hand, proving Helvig from convergence of optimal stopping problems is also easy. And the hard thing is to connect those other two. Uh, a second application concerns um, the, finance, uh, with the finance motivation I mentioned in the beginning. I mean, uh, typically things you do in the finance are, are, are pricing, hedging, Uh, utility maximization. And in all these instances, you can ask yourself, um, if you slightly change the underlying measure, uh, does it have an effect on the outcome? Or does it only change the outcome very little? With usual topology, everything fails very badly. If you uh, look at some adapted Wasserstein distance, then it turns out that you actually get Lipschitz continuity. And uh, I mean, okay, for my finance applications, of course, you would like to uh, also look at continuous time. So this works also in continuous time. And then in continuous time, you can ask yourself, um, we are imposing so much abstract structure here. Do we actually still uh, capture something of what is really going on in reality? And uh, um, 
I would claim that in fact, this is really capturing the right phenomenon in the sense that if you go down to very simple probabilistic models and the simplest possible uh, financial derivatives you can look at, then you already see that uh, these Lipschitz constants are sharp up to some numerical constants. So it really seems that this adapted Wasserstein distance is, is capturing what's going on on the level of, of, um, of changes in my finance. Um, yeah, the third result, which where we need this heavily, this is uh, concerning denseness of adapted processes in causal couplings. Yeah, so as, as pointed out by Dan Lecker, if you uh, a good motivation or for causal transport to have to be well motivated, what you would act actually want to have is really that um, adapted mappings are dense within the causal couplings. And it turns out you can prove this. And this is an upcoming paper with Dan Lecker and uh, it's very much again building on, on this uh, equivalence of topologies. Um, another problem where this is, uh, appears to be crucial concerns um, stability of martingale optimal transport. So in usual optimal transport, stability is something very basic. In martingale optimal transport, this has been um, open for a couple of years and yeah, it's, it's now proved in these independent papers. So we have a question on the, on the chat. A question. That, uh, Thank you. Yeah, maybe it's interesting. Um, so I would say this result, I mean, this result applies to uh, complete and incomplete markets uh, at the same time. I mean, there is, um, it's always, uh, it's, uh, incomplete markets, what it would say is that uh, something which is a super hedge in one model is uh, almost a super hedge in all closed models. And this is not related to whether we look at something which is complete or incomplete. Um, yeah, maybe I don't want to discuss it uh, much more now because I think I'm a bit behind time and it, uh, it leads a little bit away from, the, from my talk. Um, yeah, another application concerns weak optimal transport. So weak optimal transport, this is an extension of classical optimal transport um, due to Natal Goslan and his, his co-authors, Alibert Bouchit Champignon and uh, due to Alphonse Jodin, rather independently. Uh, the idea here is uh, to extend the framework of optimal transport in order to cover a, a, number, a number of, of, um, of other problems which are not uh, precisely fitting into the classical optimal transport. Yeah? So, uh, I mean, the original motivation stems from geometric inequalities, but actually there is, uh, I mean, this is a very incomplete list of, of uh, topics which fit into this uh, slightly extended framework. And um, something which was a little bit strange in weak optimal transport, or at least to me, was that um, proofs of very basic results, which are very simple in optimal transport, like existence and duality, uh, they turned out to be much harder in weak optimal transport. And uh, also, um, I mean, first results in, in uh, or early results on existence duality, uh, they usually use a, a lot more conditions in, 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 in weak optimal transport and somehow seem to be more complicated than necessary. And uh, it turns out that uh, this magically goes away if you look, uh, if you consider the problem with the help of such weak adapted topologies, yeah? So if you use these weak adapted topologies, it turns out that you can basically uh, use the very same ideas as in the classical framework and obtain such results in the expected generality. And then, uh, of course, this, this has a number of applications in, 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 in fields which are covered by this weak transport framework. Yeah, and then, uh, uh, final application that I want to mention, this concerns um, functional inequalities on Wiener space. So I think that uh, Remy Lassalle has, so Remy Lassalle has some proofs on, of, of, of Pellegrin's inequality, log Sobolev inequality on the Wiener space um, through cause transport. And I, I think what he sees there is, is really, I don't know, to me, this is really sheer beauty. 
Um, yeah, and of course uh, there is uh, many names and, and papers which are which are missing here. So um, yeah, I apologize that this is very incomplete here. Now, um, in the final part of my talk, I want to I'll, I'll try to take a, a bit of a step backwards and um, uh, uh, try to understand uh, uh, what could it be the, the the bigger picture of what we are doing. And I want to do this through an analogy. Yeah, so if you look at uh, probability measures on Rn, then uh, what Wasserstein distance is doing for us, it is imposing a very nice geometric space structure on the space of probability measures. And uh, I mean, of course, this has had tremendous uh, applications in, in, in of classical optimal transport. And uh, somehow what we do now is uh, we again look at, I mean, so far we've only been looking at canonical processes and these canonical processes, they are uh, probability measures on Rn again. But uh, we have discussed that uh, for uh, several probabilistic problems, you should look with a different topology and maybe with some adapted version of Wasserstein distance. And of course, a question you could ask now is, uh, um, can we do something similar? Yeah, so is there, uh, maybe can we define, or can we find some nice uh, geometric properties um, for the set of, of stochastic processes? And I mean, I'm, we are certainly not there yet, but um, I want to still discuss some, some properties of this space of canonical processes with respect to Wasserstein distance. And uh, the first thing which one should notice is that Adapted Wasserstein distance is not complete on the set of uh, on, on P of Rn. I mean, P of Rn, it turns out that this is actually a Polish topology, so there is some complete matrix here, but uh, the natural matrix are not complete. And there is a good reason why these natural matrix are not complete, yeah? And to explain this, I want to go back to this example which we had at the very beginning. Yeah, so we were looking at processes which are only a little bit apart from each other in the beginning. So this uh, law I would call Pn. And if you look at this sequence of processes, then it turns out that uh, Pn is actually a Cauchy sequence with respect to adapted Wasserstein distance. And of course, in the limit, uh, what you don't get is that those two points just become one point, yeah? So this would be the limit in the usual topology and here we are finer, yeah? So, um, what the limit would be, what we would expect the limit to be, at least informally, this would be something where you simply have this point twice, at the, at the very same position, but really two times this point. So somehow we would expect that such a sequence converges to this type of limit. And we somehow had to have to add this, uh, this type of limit to our space. And actually, um, I want to discuss two different ways of looking at this completion. Uh, the first way, I first want to explain it in this very simple case where n is equal to 2. What you do here is uh, some Wershik type construction. Yeah, so look, so you um, look at the space of probability measures on R. Here you have a Wasserstein distance with respect um, to the distance, which is the usual modulus. And then uh, you take a product with R and you obtain a bigger space. And on this bigger space, you have a Wasserstein distance with respect to another metric, which is now the usual modulus with respect to the first two coordinates plus a Wasserstein, an ordinary Wasserstein distance with respect to the second coordinates. Okay, and it turns out that um, if you do this construction, then uh, the completion of P of R2 with respect 
to some adapted Wasserstein distance, then uh, this is um, this space P of R times P of R and this Wershik type Wasserstein distance on this bigger space. And um, okay, so this is two coordinates. Um, if you have more coordinates, then uh, you just, you'd iterate this construction. And um, I think, so I think this is uh, nice from a geometric, spe geometric perspective or an optimal transport perspective, but it's uh, losing a bit the connection to stochastic processes. And so I want to present a second point of view on this, which is making the connection to stochastic processes better. And um, the concept which we consider here is so-called filtered processes. So a filtered process for us, this is some probability space with some filtration and then an, then an adapted process. Yeah, so, so far we've only been considering uh, pros canonical processes. Here we introduce also a non-trivial filtration. Um, okay, so as soon as you have uh, arbitrary spaces omega, then of course you introduce a lot of redundancy. Yeah, so I mean, you can have very different omegas, but still you have essentially the same space. So you somehow want to factor out something. And uh, what Hoover and Kiesler are doing is they say, um, let's identify two such filtered spaces if everything which a probabilist usually is doing is the same. Yeah, so they are logicians, they understand model theory very well, and they can uh, make precise sense out of this. Yeah, saying that we, we, we say that two processes are the same if everything you can do in probability for these two processes is going to be the same. Um, now, a first result which we have is saying being the same probabilistically is actually the same as having this adapted Wasserstein distance equal to zero. Yeah, so here we look at an extension of the adapted Wasserstein distance we had before, but you just put filtrations where uh, in the definition of couplings and then you, you, you find your definition of this adapted Wasserstein distance. And um, yeah, this is just a, pro, uh, a more probabilistic instead of uh, logician way of expressing that those two things have the same properties. And now the second theorem says that the completion of the set of canonical processes is exactly the set of all processes together with some filtration. Yeah, so I mean, in probability, we are all the time considering uh, stochastic processes with filtration. Here, it turns out that this appears uh, naturally as a completion with respect to this, uh, to this uh, adapted Wasserstein distances. And specifically, um, what this gives you is an identification of such processes with filtration to this uh, Wershik type construction. Okay, that's it. Uh, thank you very much for the attention. Very good. So now we, we would like to see if we have some questions from the audience. So you can either type your questions or there is a button to. Uh, uh, Thanks, Nathan. To So let's see, okay, uh, no questions maybe. Honestly, uh, I want to take advantage of having a bigger audience than usual and I would like to put an open question here. Okay. So as long as there then is I will ask you no other question. My we'll question was, uh, Andreas promised me that I could ask all questions I wanted if, uh, if I agreed to share the the session. So go ahead with your open question and then I... Uh... I mean, my, my question is, um, suppose processes x, y with filtration have distance zero, then we know all probabilistic properties uh, of these two processes are the same. So specifically, we know that if we look at uh, 
if we have any process G and we look at the stopping problem for the process X, then the result is the same as, as what we look at if we look at the stopping problem for the process Y. Yeah. And I mean, there is other ways of identifying uh, stochastic processes like LDOS, and for this is not this is not true. But uh, if you do this with a nested distance or adapted Wasserstein distance, then you obtain that this is true. Um, what seems plausible, but what we are not able to show is um, what about the converse? Suppose that two uh, stochastic processes are the same in terms of optimal stopping. Yeah, so. I mean, this is uh, for me from one way of formalizing that they are the same in terms of sequential decision problems. Does this already imply that uh, these two processes are completely the same? And I mean, of course, there is like a million open questions in this area. And I mean, we're working on some of them and uh, I think on this one, we would like to give up. So, uh, let me see. I, uh, I think you answered most most of my questions, but uh, there is one that I uh, uh, I wanted to ask. Uh, so uh, this uh, Wasserstein nested, I presumably comes with a variational principle. No, that uh, you can write uh, if you are if you are patient enough, you can write this uh, uh, this W nested as some uh, infimum over Lipschitz functions. Yes, I mean, that's some, um, yeah, some, I mean, uh, some supremum or Lipschitz functions, maybe? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's true, but I mean, it's going to be Lipschitz functions on, on probability spaces of probability spaces of probability spaces. Okay, so, 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 yeah, so, so, the, so there is not, there is no other simpler uh, variational principle for some of the of the topologies that you mentioned that uh, one can use instead of that? Um, okay, I mean, what you mentioned, I mean, I, th I think it's a super good question that what is the, is there some kantarovich rubinstein theorem for this uh, adapted distances, yeah? Yeah. And I mean, honestly, this is uh, somehow also what is, what was driving my question here that, um, if you take, a, I mean, on the on the right hand side, I mean, restrict to even maybe Lipschitz G and uh, take a supremum over all stopping times, is this going to give you a distance, which is, it's not going to be exactly the nested distance, but maybe it's something very similar. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, I mean, yeah, your question is somehow what's behind what I wrote here. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let me check. No other questions on the on the chat. So Andreas was proposing something that I don't know how I don't know how to do, which was uh, unmute everybody at the same time. Yeah, shall we? You want me to count you all in, and I'll unmute. Ah, you okay, yeah, I, I found the button. So, so I, I'm going to unmute everyone so we can uh, clap your hands together and uh, thank. Uh, uh, thank you uh, one more time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah, yeah.